Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm about to present an amazing panel who are all doing fantastic things for the world. We're going to be talking about the Hyperledger. Uh, it's kind of referred to as a consortium, but the people in the know say it's the, the Hyperledger uh, project. Uh, and these four people are going to tell you about that project. Uh, I'm Monty Mumford. I have uh, 20 years experience uh, as a tech journalist, uh, I've written for Forbes regularly as a, co uh, well, I've written for everyone, apart from the Times in London, it's the only one that I haven't done, but um, I've moved into the podcast space, we, we, we publish a weekly video podcast uh, called Block Speak, you know, blockchain, BS, the opposite of BS, you know, all that branded stuff, uh, and, and I've interviewed many figures in, in the tech world from John McAfee, actually today, I've gone from John McAfee to you four, you know, crazy guy who's now um, is now admitted that he's in Belarus at the moment still on the run from the police and so now I've got to moderate a panel about the hyper ledger project I can't wait anyway so I've got four people in front of me um, the first person I can see is Brian uh, Brian Be Bellendorf he's the uh, di executive director of this project um, also part of Linux which I think will give you an idea of what he's going to say please introduce yourself to the audience sir Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, so I'm Brian Bellendorf. As far as I know, I'm not in Belarus. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhere else in the uh, somewhere in the United States. Uh, but uh, uh, and and in my uh, spacious library, I just had to go toe to toe with Monty on his books. Um, I'm executive director of Hyperledger, uh, and we are part of the Linux Foundation. Um, I, and and Hyperledger really serves as the home for an open source. A collection of open source uh, software initiatives uh, that are focused on trying to build a, a, a infrastructure for distributed ledger projects and for enterprise use of blockchain technology. I've been doing this for four years. Um, uh, other background, I've worked for a number of uh, organizations. I've started a, a number of companies um, uh, kind of in the web and technology and open source domain. Started something called the Apache Software Foundation um, back when dinosaurs roamed the web. I uh, and worked at the White House for a few years and was CTO for the World Economic Forum for a few years. So um, I have not partied with Kim Kardashian, or I think it was that you were mentioning, or, or uh, yeah. anyone yeah. else, but have um, uh, among many, mate, among many. <laughs> I bet you've been in the White House for a few years. That's something. I've been I've been to Buckingham Palace once. Oh, uh, nice. That was quite an experience. Uh, they don't serve alcohol until after the speeches. But I had the best canapes in the world. It's really frustrating that she have a glass of champagne. I'd love to talk to you about the White House. I'd love to be inside there at the moment. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, second, and by no means secondly, uh, we have Grace Hartley, who's a strategic associate uh, at Consensus. And I believe you're part of the Pegasus project, which I hope is flying. Ha, ha, ha. Um, but I don't know what that is. So it'd be great if you'd explain to me, as well as the audience, what, what, who, who you are and what you do. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, excited for the panel. Uh, as Monty mentioned, I'm Grace Hartley. I'm a strategy and operations associate at Consensus on the Pegasus team. Uh, basically, Pegasus, we're dedicated to building enterprise Ethereum. Almost a year ago, which is crazy, we submitted our Ethereum client, uh, Pantheon, now Hyperledger Basu, to Hyperledger. Uh, so excited to talk to you all about kind of that process, you know, our experience being part of that as a Hyperledger member, as well as a project team and, and uh, yeah, share more about that. I have not traveled in the same circles as either of you, but definitely excited to talk more. Yeah, but you've got years on us, you know, you'll be fine. By the time you're, at, right, you're our age, you'd have probably taken the world over. Um, was, it, was it age is wasted? On, was it the money is wasted on the, on the old and youth is wasted on the old, something like that, anyway. Um, next, we have a French man, uh, Romain, uh, Pellerin he is the CTO of IOH OK, which I find very difficult to remember. Uh, I love Hong Kong, maybe. I don't know. Tell us about yourself, please, uh, Remy. You'll, you'll get used to it, IOHK. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I, I am the CTO for, for four months now. So, pretty recent in the company. So, amazing company that is uh, building uh, Cardano, uh, raising uh, Shele, or decentralized uh, version. Uh, of the node and um, happy to be here discussing about uh, Hyperledger. We just joined and we are uh, thrilled to, to, to join. We have several uh, um, 
access or strategies we would like to to share knowledge with the community uh, share technologies and uh, and uh, yeah, you know uh, help the enterprise uh, join the cardano ecosystem okay great well, i think they'd be very pleased to have you why is it taking you so long to join when did it begin they they were just waiting i guess for me to join <laughs> very good exactly Great response. Uh, finally, and he looks like he's in mid-code, uh, it's Nathan Grange. He's the, senior, or the director of uh, engineering at Kiva, a micro-lending company. Please explain yourself, Nathan, about what you're doing behind you, first of all. Well, you know, I'm a long-time contributor to Hyperledger. Uh, I helped start the Hyperledger Indie project and work on the Hyperledger Aries project. And this is some of the cryptography that's uh, available in the Hyperledger Ursa library for zero knowledge proofs behind me. Uh, just up from having explained some of this stuff to some people that I've been working with. Um, and uh, I'm coming to you from Utah in the US and I've been working on decentralized identity and how we identify things, organizations and people to help support all the different kinds of blockchain tech that we're all working on building. Okay, fantastic. Presumably you're all members, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'll go back to you, Brian, as because um, uh, of your library, yours bigger than mine, if you know what I mean. Um, how long have you been involved with this? How, how does it kind of overlap with Linux and, and, and what's the kind of philosophy for it? And I would also add, why are you doing it? You know, those type of questions that we'll, we'll be going through. Sure. So um, the Linux Foundation itself uh, got its kind of origin around 2002 when folks started to realize, wow, this Linux operating system is growing. Lots of people are using it without even like uh, people acknowledging how widely used it is. Um, uh, and uh, I think that was about the time Microsoft started calling it a cancer. Um, uh, and oh, really? Source as a whole, a cancer. You probably remember that. Um, uh, and, uh, and there were some big questions to answer in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property and who owns the copyright and different things, uh, patent attacks, um, uh, but also kind of branding attacks. Where's the home for these communities, right? Um, what started out with Linus just uh, publishing onto a Usenet news group his first version of a kernel, right? Because he wanted to be able to do his um, student research projects on his um, home PC rather than having to schlep down to, to um, University of Helsinki, uh, you know, uh, through miles of uh, frozen uh, wasteland or something like that i don't know um you know what started out with very humble origins started to become kind of massively part of big companies and that sort of thing to the point where ibm was taking it about super bowl ads uh for linux you probably remember that um uh, very creepy weird super bowl ads too um so i uh, the linux foundation was started to try to answer the you know the hit by a bus factor around linux you know the concern that if linus got bored got hired away by somebody else whatever um that what would happen to the project, um, uh, but also to help organize the commercial ecosystem so that people could help each other and build on top of kind of a, a rising platform rather than battle each other in a zero sum game, you know, uh, dominance for to be the Linux company, right? Um, and uh, it chose a different path than other uh, organizations around open source did, uh, some like the Apache Software Foundation, um, uh, really focused on being a nonprofit and, a, 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 you know, kind of member driven, individual driven kind of thing. Um, which didn't work as uh, well. I mean, does work in its own way, uh, but depends very much on volunteerism. So this uh, this this project is nonprofit as well, right? So uh, the Linux Foundation is a 501c6 industry consortium, uh, which is, is, is a not-for-profit designation. It means we are required by the IRS and others to have to be creating uh, public goods, creating things that, that um, are, are for public consumption, but we're organized around um, and funded by membership dues, um, by companies who join um, <clears throat> not just the Linux uh, Foundation, but also and join projects particular to different uh, domains. So for example, you might have heard of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, which is focused on uh, Kubernetes and other containerization, uh, Linux Foundation Networking, which is focused on software that telcos uh, use to manage their infrastructure. And we've gone into a lot of different uh, areas, automotive, AI, and, and Hyperledger started um, right at the end of 2015. 
uh, right kind of as a lot of the blockchain stuff was starting to, to really take off. Obviously, uh, 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 Satoshi Nakamoto's paper was 2008, et cetera. But by 15, people realized there was more to this than just the cryptocurrency angle. Um, and I had been working actually at a venture capital firm, uh, talking to a lot of the, the Bitcoin uh, style companies and super skeptical about um, really whether they were going to have the kind of impact that they thought that they would. Um, <clears throat> and so when I saw this announcement around the Hyperledger, I go, I want to get closer to that because it felt, felt like there was something more real there and tangible there for me. Um, so I joined as executive director in about June of 2016 and grew it from uh, 30 member organizations at that point to it's now 250 different organizations, nonprofits, but, but, but also, uh, and, and academics and uh, institutions, but also predominantly companies, large and small, um, uh, that are working to commercialize this space. And so really half of what we do is help organize those open source communities, help build an umbrella organization for what are a number of different initiatives. Um, Hyperledger Indie, which is focused on digital identity. Yeah. Jesu, which is actually a magnetic Ethereum client, but also focused for enterprise needs. Hyperledger Fabric, which uh, is perhaps more uh, 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 um, uh, the most widely used. I mean, it's hard to get st hard statistics on this, but yeah. um, we think it's the most widely used platform out there for DLT, distributed ledger types of applications. Um, but I mean, you're, you're fascinating, but I have to stop you because there are three other people. Give me one last. Give me one last sentence before you one get another sentence. Turn. Was to organize that, but also the commercial ecosystem as well. So training and certification, and making sure everybody in our community uh, can can be uh, out there marketing their business and building on top uh, upon each other rather than competing against. Okay, them. all right. A community, you know. Yeah. I mean, I used to work a lot with Java. We we had a 2005. We were very ahead of our time with mobile games, um, yep. and unfortunately, there was a Finnish company called Rovio. They kept sending us their rubbish games uh, to the point where they were going out of existence. And they sent us their 51st game to test on Java uh, for $251,000. And we said, no, we don't want it. And that game was Angry Birds. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but what, what, I mean, so you're talking to a loser. Um, but I would, uh, I'm going to you, Grace. So one of those times in the mobile, you know, the mobile content world, um, the big, 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 acceleration was interoperability you know in the old days you couldn't send text from vodafone to orange or you you know everything was you know keeping to itself does you know connecting enterprises to the blockchain in this way how do you make it in what are the problems and the challenges with um, with interoperability is there, is there anything i need to know uh, safe to say there's probably a few things to think about when you're thinking about interoperability i'm sure brian and nathan and, and roman have uh, good insights as well, but uh, it depends what you're talking about when you're talking about interoperability. There's sometimes one thing that we always talk about consensus and and with Hyperledger Besu and, and that project is that it works on public and private chains. So uh, that's kind of interesting if you want to use it for different optionality. Um, you could also talk about using it for different projects. So if you wanted to make fabric interoperable with Besu or Indy or, or uh, be able to send transactions between those layers, I think there's also a project Hyperledger Avalon, which is pretty interesting that I'm not an expert on, but you can kind of send, I think, uh, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, um, you can use, you know, different kind of Ethereum clients, so Besu or Fabric and kind of send transactions through them, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, so I think the question that I always kind of challenge people when they ask about interoperability is, what do you want to interoperate? Do you want to be able to send transactions? Do you want to uh, have yeah. different platforms talk to each other? It just depends. but. So the, whole, so the whole subject of interoperability is fragmented. <laughs> you could say that for sure. <laughs> so, so, so what would you say would be, I, I mean, I know Remain's got a lot of knowledge in this subject, but what, what would you say would be the, bigger cha the biggest challenge for interoperability in the most non-fractured way possible, if that makes any sense? Oh boy, the biggest challenge for interoperability? Um... I think uh, one thing that's always interested is standards. So uh, right. within Hyperledger and within Ethereum, uh, so the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is dedicated to uh, building standards basically and documentation for consensus protocols, for example, or, or privacy, all that. Uh, I think uh, agreeing and getting companies to agree on standards is pretty challenging. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, that is probably one of the largest challenges, but um, Definitely curious to hear the rest of the group's thoughts as well. Uh, but, well, straight over to you, Remain, because I know this is something that you're very passionate about. 
Yeah, I was uh, actually I started as a mobile game developer. Uh, uh, so we we probably failed your games as well. <laughs> exactly. I Sorry. Actually, actually, did my PhD in uh, uh, multiplayer location based. Uh, did you really? Games. That's interesting. Yeah. So I I actually used uh, several of the Java technologies like Jitsumi, Doja, and yes, absolutely, and MIDP and all all those all those stuff, but. Uh, Yes, interoperability is al always uh, required when you have a fragmented uh, market and uh, the mobile industry was hyper uh, uh, fragmented at that time. It's a bit less fragmented, but you have a lot of fragmentation on Android um, still. And uh, yeah, building uh, cross-platform technology or cross-networks uh, technologies are uh, is fundamental if you want adoption. Yeah. And I think uh, when we are, we are in, a, in, a, in an industry blockchain which uh, lacks uh, adoption uh, for, for currently, we are very early uh, stage in the, in the technology. And I think that's uh, an, an objective of Hyperledger is actually federating uh, efforts to convince the enterprise to uh, leverage those uh, technologies in their in their system. So, I think interoperability is a first a business uh, uh, requirement for us uh, because if we onboard, let's say, uh, uh, a company A, and uh, I don't know, Grace onboard a com company B on Bezu, they are isolated by blockchains. The blockchain yeah. is silo. It's yeah. a, a secure silo. So. Uh, um, if we want to bring adoption to, to, to blockchain, um, we, to the private or public or consortium blockchain, you need, a, you need to create bridges between the technologies. So you can actually have uh, your company A to talk to the company B and share assets. So you have um, trends in, uh, in the industry like um, internet of blockchains or um, uh, swaps or atomic swaps or even non-atomic swaps for, some, for, for certain people. Uh, it's all a, a matter of creating bridges between uh, ecosystems and between networks. It's a bit similar to the um, telecom industry. Yeah. In some, uh, capacity. You have a group of users that are isolated by providers and providers had to uh, con interconnect to each other and uh, then you have internet, etc. Yeah, sounds a little bit like the airline industry trying to create bridges between countries to see if, you know, we're going back, we're going the other way when it comes to airlines, but we're going back to a more fragmented world. Anything can happen, right? You know, it's crazy. Nathan, do you have an opinion on interoperability or are these two fine people kind of summed it up? Well, interoperability is, is really interesting because we often think of it just in terms of those atomic swaps or tracking a single object across multiple companies or systems. And certainly that consortium building and how do you get people to agree and use the same system is really important. But you know, we also want the system to be decentralized so that everyone can do the things they want to in their own way and in their own time. And that's what makes blockchain powerful is it allows us to map all of these different entities to cryptographic keys so that everyone can independently uh, do their own thing and, and we know what belongs where and to whom. Um, so that, that collective trust that comes out of uh, everyone being able to operate independently is, is one of the powers of, of blockchain technology, especially in business. And that's, I think one of the, the cool things about participating in Hyperledger is we have lots of different companies doing lots of different things with that tech um, and lots of developers to interact with to help provide those kinds of insights to help make your solutions better. So, so it's kind of like, so, so, so the, the Hyperledger um, project it's all about community and collaboration. And it might be just where the interesting code is happening. Would that be right? Well, and hopefully there's a lot of interesting code happening, right, Brian? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, Monty, you should write our, our copy for us because like that's, that's our message, a uh, key message for sure. Um, is, uh, yes, and, please. You know, one of the decisions we had early on as a community was um, whether to be all in on one architectural approach to doing enterprise blockchain or to recognize that it was early enough in the field of blockchain to, to try to have, um, be open to other approaches, right? And it's very different actually from how Linux started. You know, uh, Linus Torvalds had the benefit of 30 years of operating system design yeah. and, and research. 
And he was just really, I mean, and not just a uh, full credit to him, but like he was implementing the POSIX standard that had come before, right? The, the APIs that, had, you know, all the other Unix vendors were implementing. Um, and here in blo the blockchain world in 2016, and even still now is younger than where operating systems were in 1991. Um, so uh, collectively, we looked around at everybody involved with Hyperledger at the time and said, let's um, pursue the path of kind of uh, being a home for multiple different approaches. And so um, we have now six different um, ledgers, as we call them. Hyperledger Bezu is one, Indy is another, Fabric is another, there's um, Sawtooth and Aroha and Burrow. Um, and each of these has have a slightly different approach to, to this space, similar to how Postgres is different from MySQL, is very different from MongoDB, you know, um, and, and, and so part of our, our burden, but also the opportunity is how do we get these different efforts working together in a way that wouldn't happen if they were just disparate GitHub repos and different organizations, right? So a common license, uh, a bunch of cross-cutting architect uh, working groups around architecture and identity and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and trying to really learn from each other about the best ways to build community and where those touch points can happen. And that and form of interoperability is very, <laughs> it's much more meta than talking about like a protocol, yeah, yeah. but yeah, really yeah. core to who we are at Hyperledger and what we're doing. So, so as you come up to like five years of existence, what, what do you think you did wrong within those five years? Is there anything that you, that you could have done better? Uh, it would be extremely conceited to me to say, I, I, you know, there is nothing wrong that we did. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the challenge for the, uh, the last few years has been that um, I, I, every blockchain use case, I, I, public or private, I can, I, you know, supply chain traceability, trade finance, all of these things. Um, you can always implement that uh, a solution to that problem or that implement that use case with a centralized system with an Uber style or, or PayPal style, you know, kind of central repository, even things like cryptocurrencies, you know, that's what arguably PayPal is a centralized cryptocurrency network, right? Absolutely. Um, or Ripple, if you want to call it, uh, call them that, right? And they're um, going to take uh, Bitcoin. They've, they're, they said last week they're going to accept Bitcoin. So, so how do you get people to understand the, the, the advantage, the value of being, building decentralized systems when in fact they cost more to build? They require um, bootstrapping and coordinating with, with lots of organizations, you know, much more complicated to do than launching your own update to a system or a new, your own new project, right? So um, I think that the challenge over the last four or five years has been uh, uh, getting the use cases into production. And I don't think it's a technology problem. The tech has taken a few years to gestate now. Things like Fabric and Bezu and Indy are all post 1.0, you know, well into to, um, kind of a mature stage where people are running production systems on it. Um, but figuring out how to get that that last mile of folks into production and the and the consortia building at that layer that has to happen um, uh, uh, has been a challenge. And I I don't know that I would have spent money differently or or focused. Yeah. No, okay. Fair enough. Like, yeah. Well, you've got re yeah, you've got remain now. Well, oh, this yeah, is where having. He's... Yep. Little bit That's of lag on, on your side, uh, Monty. Uh, what was that? What was that, sir? You are lagging. I missed that. I am. I should be. I am in a very high area. Fast broadband. <laughs> it's better now. Sorry, yeah. you were seeing. Okay. Uh, no, I was just saying that now that you're part of the project, everything's going to be all right. You know, you were the missing link. Maybe. I was, I was, I was trying. I was trying to make a joke, but it failed completely. No, so no, that's no. why. That's why I'm quickly going to go to Grace, um, and Ethereum. I, I am the uh, idiot who lost thirty thousand pounds of Ethereum on his wallet, on his phone. You know, I got 5 million views on the BBC, but I didn't get my money back. I've interviewed the CZ from Binance. It's still, I still won't get my money back. So you did refer to earlier about um, Ethereum and what you were doing. I, I just, uh, I'm not sure if that's part of Pegasus, but I just, it just, I'm, I'm just always interested in Ethereum because, yeah, I'd love to hear more. Sure. Um, so Ethereum basically um, is exactly what Pegasus we work on. We build. Uh, it sounds kind of funny, but we build the Ethereum blockchain, right? And we're the one of the leaders of the Hyperledger Basu project. So Hyperledger Basu is an Ethereum client. It runs on private and public chain Ethereum. What's what's kind of interesting about Ethereum is that you can run it in mainnet settings uh, and run a node there, or you can run it in like a private consortium setting and and have kind of a private network if you like. Uh, that's kind of one of the interesting things. Ethereum, obviously, um, we I'm incredibly biased, so the rest of the group should be also chime in too. But uh, Ethereum is pretty interesting because it has one of the 
largest developer communities of 250,000 developers working on Ethereum uh, to date. Uh, that number, I'm pretty sure, is accurate. Uh, it also is kind of different because it has you know, native uh, digital currency as one option um, and also uh, um, you know, has kind of many different use cases that have been built on it. Uh, also, it's, you know, I'm, I think it's kind of cool because Ethereum plays within Hyperledger uh, as well as, you know, the Ethereum community. So it's, you know, with Basu and then Hyperledger Burrow are both kind of, uh, Hyperledger Burrow is an EVM implementation, Ethereum virtual machine implementation. So it's really interesting because we're kind of touching a lot of the different blockchain development, even outside of the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, yeah. And I think that's kind of uh, pretty exciting and, and pretty unique. Um, and, and yeah, I think that just there are lots of op uh, possibilities when you use Ethereum. One thing I would say, um, I've interviewed 20 people for BlockSpeak, my podcast, Shill, Shill, Shill. Um, and I am a very diverse man and I've been woke since I was 18, 40 years ago when I was a young punk, West Indian music, London, you know, we're all the same and all that stuff. And I've had one woman on the show, right? Everyone else has been white, you know what I mean? Um, and then you've got these crazy mad people from crypto and all that. But it just, again, it reminds me of a trade show where 85% of the people there are men. Do you find, I don't know if this is one of the, one of the you know, the directives of, uh, of the high religion project, but is there any kind of anything in there based on diversity? Do you, do you find yourself alone in a world of men or is it, is it quite, is it quite, you know, even? Yeah, I don't like to think of it like that uh, for sure. No, I think actually I applaud Hyperledger and even the Ethereum community. It's very much an all are welcome here inclusive environment. Um, and I think uh, what I actually thought was really cool was on International Women's Day this year, Hyperledger featured, uh, I think, about 15 or 20 women in the community who are leaders in the community. Yeah, uh, whether it's and, and I think what they're also doing really well is focusing on um, not just the developers who might be building it, but there's always you know, people like myself around the projects helping support it, which I think is really cool, too. So even if yeah. maybe the developers are a little more... Uh, male like uh, dominated you know there are many other kind of ways to contribute in the community that um, you know have very different diverse opinions and and that's kind of why i like being a part of the hyperledger community if i'm being honest oh, well, that, I mean, that's, that sounds awesome i mean you've got me on side already do you know what i mean <laughs> yes. um nathan you look a bit like a, a dominant domineering male developer um <laughs> sorry um what can you add to this discussion now? What would you, what, what, what's your passion? Not only so much about being part of the project, but about being part of what, what, what I find is so weird is, is that this afternoon I interviewed John McAfee, the notorious crypto pirate or whatever you want to call it. Right. And there are lots of people like him in crypto. And then on the other side, I mean, I've done blockchain keynotes, really bad ones, actually. Um, blockchain for good and all that stuff and the way that i hear all four of you speak it's like it's so the opposite of all of these chances and snake oil people you, you know what i mean and nathan are you building something amazing here are you are you building a second internet i mean the architecture that that, that uh, brian referred to earlier are you doing something special here there's a lot of things that are really neat going on inside of the Hyperledger project. I can talk a little bit about the identity work that we've been doing. Please um, do. In particular, you don't change the internet by burning it down and starting over again. Uh, the internet's a collaborative effort that is, at least at its heart, decentralized in that you know, when there's new innovations that come forward, um, they can be adopted based on their own merits. And with the digital identity approaches that we're working on it, Think of it as the next stage of decentralization, even beyond smart contracts or side chains. It gives us the ability to do peer-to-peer -peer information protocols, let everybody have their own meaning to the data, but then understand and interpret that data for their own and build trust frameworks and trust systems in a dynamic way. Um, and that really lets us do a lot of the things we wanted to do on the internet for a long time. It lets us have discoverability. It lets us have a more peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the servers that we interact with and with the information yeah. systems we interact with where we have the power to revoke things. We have the power to share or not to share. And we can mix and match the information attributes that companies build about us in a way that we gain control and uh, can exert that influence. And that's one of the reasons why it's really valuable as a protocol 
at a place like Kiva because it allows us to build financial inclusion where when the system would normally leak and prevent these people from participating, it lets us empower those people to, to collect and build those data attributes and then leverage them in order to, to, to plug those holes and participate in ways that weren't possible before. No, I mean, um, yeah, I said, can you tell us a bit more about Kiva then? Because that sounds to me a little micro lending. It sounded, sounds like the Grameen one well, of project that was set up in Bangladesh about, you know, giving the mobile phone to the woman of the village. Then she would lend the money out because the men were useless and, and all that stuff. It was slightly besmirched, I think, later on. You know what I mean? But what is, what, what are, you, are, you, are you talking about, you know, serving the unbanked or, or what does Kiva actually do? Well, in particular, the protocol team at Kiva is working on extending the reach uh, of information so that the unbanked can participate in systems like the micro lending platform that you're probably familiar with, with Kiva.org. Yeah. Um, more broadly, the SSI protocol we're talking about is being used in lots of different settings, whether it be healthcare credentials that can preserve your privacy as we try to tackle the, the crisis that, that people are dealing with right now, or whether it be, you know, opening up new opportunities for information sharing and exchange so that advertising isn't the only game in town for how yeah. we build and develop things on the internet. Would you, would you say, I mean, one of the things that I think about the internet after the beauty of it, you know, I mean, I'm not a techie, but I still thought it was an amazing tool. The same as a mobile phone was, you know, I think it's all gone a bit wrong. I think, I think the internet's infected with ads and scammers and crooks and information that I don't want, and I have to work really hard to get it out of my life and all that stuff. Do you think you're building a kind of safer place? I certainly hope so. And, uh, you know, we want to build a, a place where privacy and security are not considered at odds with one another, but where one supports the other. I mean, when we think about how commerce works, businesses don't share everything about what they're doing with everyone else. They don't publish it all to the public blockchain because they'd lose transaction advantage in terms of the ecosystem they deal with. Privacy is not just something yeah, no, that yeah. people with tinfoil hats think about. It's something that makes you know, the economy run in a lot of ways. And so yeah, yeah. this idea that blockchain technology directly supports that effort and the way we use these cryptographic tools to make that happen is not just something for businesses to use, but something that can have reach all the way down to all the endpoints of the internet, I think is something that's, it's fun to think about and fun to work on here at Hyperledger. I think, uh, I think if you could do 20% of what you just said, you'd be doing the world a great favor. Uh, R Remain, is that something that you endorse as well? Something that something that you're in this for the love and the, the better world? Yes, for sure. Um, I think Hyperledger should help uh, the enterprise to understand what blockchain is. I spent uh, three years of my life trying to explain <laughs> to the enterprise what is blockchain and their blockchain. It's, a, it's a database, it's a, what, what is it? It's a, it's a trust platform actually. It's a, the layer of trust that you, you will uh, construct on top of the, the internet. So um, actually we are going to remove a, a, a lot you call, of- You call it a layer of trust? On top of yeah. the internet, okay. Yeah, a, a trust platform, yes. It's an aggregation of blockchains, uh, I think. But anyway, to make it simple, it's a trust platform that you can leverage to uh, directly inter interact with someone without relying on a third party. You know, a trusted third party that will ensure that you have the credentials you should have and uh, the history that you, you have. And I think uh, I'm a technologist, but... Uh, that industry, blockchain industry, is so uh, advanced or complicated to, to handle that we, we need to... to, that to is the, that's, the word, that, that's the word for me. So it seems that in the last couple of years, right? I mean, I'm, I'm reasonably intelligent, you know, the books and all that stuff, right? But some of the phrases that you've used, I'm going to have to record this myself and then look them up because it's something else to learn and all that stuff. And the blockchain to me seemed very uncomplicated at the start. And Extremely. now it seems like really, really complicated. Extremely. And uh, that doesn't help uh, adoption. If you talk about some, some, something that people will take uh, months to, to understand, you, you, you can't sell. It's, uh, people are, have something else to do, you know, they have to work. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I do think that's a, I do 
sorry if I can jump in. I oh, think that's, go ahead. that is a function of just the progression in any technology domain. I mean, I remember writing HTML and CGI scripts by hand, um, closing my, my tags carefully. Uh, uh, Nathan's laughing. I assume he did some of that too. Um, you know, and then uh, I, I, and now there's incredibly complex systems. And I, I, a lot of that um, is uh, unnecessary, but a lot of it is just kind of the fruits of the competition of ideas, right? And, and something's going to net out. Um, and I think the same thing will happen in the blockchain space where um, there's, you, you start on this kind of like Cambrian explosion is the term that I've used, you know, of like lots of ideas, lots of funding to try slightly different ways of doing things. Um, and then uh, Darwinian uh, selection uh, kind of uh, takes, takes effect and a few of those net out. Um, well, so, so what's, what's, a, what, what's a Cambrian explosion? I've never heard that phrase. So is that your phrase? No, uh, it's uh, not my phrase. It's a, uh, if you look at the, I think there's a Wikipedia page for it, I'm sure, but yeah, there's I'll a period it. of time in, G uh, uh, in, in Earth's history where uh, in a very short window of, I think, a couple of dozen million years, um, uh, something uh, like, like a, a doubling of the number of species emerged yeah. or something like that. Just, oh, no, great. just this the is, right conditions. This is my shit. I love that stuff. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, so just the right conditions to allow all these different options, but then eventually, you know, the meteor strikes <laughs> uh, or the, uh, 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 the environment gets a lot tougher. And certainly the last year or two, you know, the funding picture, forget the COVID-19, but the funding picture has, has kind of dried up and people have had to get more serious about working with each other yeah. on common technologies and only building what you have to. Um, I think before, you know, 2016, 2017, a lot of people would thought we're going to build the whole stack do it entirely ourselves and now there's a lot more focus on collaboration because because resources are more fine oh, and i think also current conditions right you know i i, I kind of would like to think there'd be a cambrian explosion of ideas during this you know crisis and we can come out of this as better people and, and all that stuff you know uh, we're nearly out of time i don't feel as if we've even begun which is kind of always a good sign uh so grace i'm going to give the last word to you because you're surrounded by four men and you deserve it and you you know Let's, let's, you know, let's have you last. Give us some words of love for the hyper. Just, just sign off on a very happy note, please. All right, I will try my best. Uh, I think, I hope this panel has kind of showed, you know, the breadth of activity that's going on in Hyperledger and, you know, not saying we all have all the answers, but I think a lot of us have a lot, a lot of uh, interesting point of views that we can learn from each other. And I think it's exciting, you know, to have new members always joining, new uh, projects joining, uh, new working groups always for, like sparking up because I think, as you can tell from this conversation, it's pretty early days and we're still all learning. And, uh, but I think it's pretty, pretty exciting time. So very excited. Well, that, so, sounds, that sounds upbeat for me. Uh, I've learned about the Cambrian explosion, which I'm going to look, I had found out something actually. Uh, about the word deflowering a virgin. Uh, it came from uh, knights with a K. Uh, whenever they were trying to court a woman, they would go into the forest and try and find a rose that no one had ever touched before and then deflower the rose. And that was the way that they won the heart of the woman. You know, it's not for everybody, but, you know, I put it in my little book as an interesting fact. Um, thank you very much for an extraordinarily insightful panel. Um, I think I was out of my depth for a little bit on a couple of the things that you said, uh, but I'll, I'll fix that by some reading. Uh, and if I'm, you know, befuddled a little bit or perplexed, but still interested, um, I hope the audience feels the same way. Uh, you can now get rid of me. Uh, and we're, I think you all, all know how to do it. Uh, a Q and a for the panel. Um, you know, I think that will be of great value to all of you. Uh, I'm Monty Mumford, the co-founder of Blockspeak. Uh, I've been your host, your moderator, your stand-up idiot, whatever. Um, uh, a big round of applause to my panellists. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and onwards.